Welcome everybody to the Little Athletics New South Wales Sunday Coaching School. My name is Darren Wenzer. I'm the Head of Coach and Volunteer Development at Little Athletics New South Wales. It is wonderful to have Rennell Hobson as our guest today. Now, Rennell is a specialist running and strength coach for sprint and running sport athletes. She's the founder of the Academy of Sport Speed Australia and Running with Rennell. Now, amongst a long list of qualifications, Rennell has a master's degree in high performance coaching and a bachelor degree in sports science and coaching. Now, she is a regular presenter at strength conditioning uh, and fitness conventions and has delivered her running courses and athlete clinics across Australia, the UK and Asia. Now, as a master's athlete, Rennell has won six world championship medals and holds multiple state, national and Oceania titles in the sprint events and is a previous world record holder in the four by 100 meter relay. Now, to top it all off, in 2019, Rennell was awarded the Australian Strength Conditioning Association's Performance Development Coach of the Year. Wow. Welcome, Rennell. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a big introduction. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It is absolutely wonderful to have you with us. So, so thank you for, for your time. And we're really looking forward to this chat. Uh, today. Now, we love, Renelle, to get a little bit of background. Obviously, I've just given you a bit of background, but we'd love to go further back. So to begin with, I would love to ask you, where did you grow up, Renelle, and what do you remember about playing sport as a kid and through those early years? Oh, wow. Well, I actually grew up in Bankstown, um, and it was right on the corner of Bankstown, Condal Park, and Yaguna. Um, and so... Um, one of the things that I do remember is that I grew up in the 70s and the 80s and in the 70s everyone lived on a quarter acre block um, and one of the things that I really remember about sport is that we played sport relentlessly every day so it was kind of like you would go to school and at school you would you know, you chew down your lunch as quickly as possible so you could play games like Bull Rush. You know, you'd get home and as soon as you finished your homework, which in those days took 10, 15 minutes tops, you know, you'd go outside and you'd play um, sport with your neighbours and you'd play games like Stuck in the Mud and Red Light and Bull Rush again and all these sorts of games. And so the big thing that I remember growing up in those times is that there was so much space to play and that play was encouraged to the point where your parents would kick you out of the house so that all you did was run around and you would play constantly. Um, and I remember that in those days as well, you could have a legitimate winter sport and summer sport, um, which is one of the sad things for me working with youth in sport at the moment, because at this point in time, the seasons tend to overlap. So you'll have athletes that, like myself, I used to do athletics in the summer at Bankstown Little Athletics. Um, and I used to do netball through the winter. And you would distinctly have a four week break between your summer season and your winter sports. Whereas now what's happened is that because the seasons have been extended and they've tried to um, almost uh, create an elite environment in youth sport, now you'll have netball players that can't actually um, you know, start the track season at the time when it should be started, or you've got girls who love to sprint, boys who love to sprint, who actually are being um, disadvantaged in their winter sport, football, netball, whatever it might be, because the seasons overlap so much and they're saying that they can't, you know, actually have a representative, um, you know, position in one or the other because they're not having that ability to have distinct seasons in summer and winter. And so then that brings about problems with early specialization and all those sorts of things, which I'm sure that we'll talk about with youth sport coming up. Um, but the big thing is just really about um, having so much time to run and play and jump and hop and skip and do all those sorts of things that we used to do in the 70s and 80s, which all of the coaches that I'm sure are on tonight will see that we're having issues with those basic functional athletic movement patterns now youth which now need to be trained because they're not developed naturally through those age groups yeah no, that's that's I, I, and and obviously that that gave you a really good grounding and, and that's something that you sound like you you believe in and, and maybe we should be returning to those those things these days i mean i don't know if we'll ever be able to return to those days i mean especially with kids living in apartment buildings which horrifies me um, but that's just the way that the world is 
because um, the population is so much greater now. Um, but I think that I think that we we really uh, it, it saddens me in the fact that we were developing things. I mean, if you think of games like Stuck in the Mud, you're accelerating, decelerating, stopping. You were breaking, so you were learning all of those things from like six years of age through to twelve. I mean, I know that I didn't start any formalized sport until I was twelve years of age. Um, you know, I remember playing netball for school and doing athletics through school and all those sorts of things, and I loved being fast. Um, but the thing is that, you know, I didn't actually start with little athletics until I was 12 years of age. And I think that's because, um, you know, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Do you know what I mean? I think that even now with the football players and the netball players that I work with, so, mo so many of them um, are engaged in so many different sports so that they build all of those motor learning skills and they have a good foundation of athletic movement before they actually go into the specific sport, which they end up still being in at 16, 17 and 18. So I think for us kids that grew up in the 70s, um, I think just being able to play those games, you learn to accelerate, decelerate, break on the stop. You know, you're learning change of direction and, and maneuverability in a game situation. You don't even realize that you're developing these skills. Um, and so then that leads you into your sport quite well. Whereas now we have to teach those skills. And um, coaching, Renelle, where, where, where and how did coaching begin for you? Um, I was 17, I think, and I was playing representative netball and I was asked, asked to um, coach a junior netball team. And so I thought, well, this will be fun um, because I really loved coaching and I really loved the idea of training, even more so than competing. I was really fascinated with the whole training process. Um, so I took that on board and it was really funny because at the time, my own uh, rep netball coach was coaching an opposing junior team in the same competition that I'd been asked. And we were up against each other in the grand final that year, which was quite funny. And then I ended up winning. So my team won the premiership that year. And then I had to go straight into my grand final with my coach. And he said to me, that's it. We're not going to discuss that. Let's just go and play. <laughs> so from that point in time, I was hooked. Um, and so I really, I think that coaching that team as well, because um, they were kind of a team of misfits. And I, I think I really learned from a young age um, you know, that you need to build relationships with your athletes. Um, and I've carried that through even um, as a coach today. But I think that's really what led me to, to decide that, yeah, this is something that I'd want to do, do you know what I mean, for the rest of my life. I love this whole coaching. I had a passion for sport. Um, and I had a passion for development, even though I didn't know what that was back then. I realise now that that's where my passion was in, in taking, a, taking an athlete and developing them into something special. So now I know that what, that what that was, but at the time I didn't quite understand what it was that I loved about it, but that's what it was. And amongst, since you've been coaching, Renelle, do you have any favourite coaching moments or any, any achievements, any highlights that, 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 that stick in your mind? Um, in terms of coaching, it's the same as teaching. You love it when the athletes get it. So, you know, one of the trickiest things to teach is relaxation in top speed, you know, because especially to, to young kids, um, or it might be the fact that you're um, teaching the young athletes about, you know, how to get out of the blocks explosively or maneuverability, um, you know, for their foot patterning work in terms of on the court or on the field with them footballers and netballers. But when they get it and it sticks, that's real joy for me. I think the passion for me is, seeing the smile on their face when they get something. Um, that's why I love it. That's why I do it. Um, and I think the other thing too is that my favourite coaching moments or achievements, I mean, you know, the PBs and the premierships and all those sorts of things are fantastic. I mean, the Fury Girls won the premiership last year, which was really exciting. You know, I've had, um, you know, athletes, you know, go on to national championships and do really well. But I think that the individual personal achievements from the young athletes where you see so much joy in them and you see that their self-esteem kicks up a notch. I always talk about the self-esteem bank and every little thing that they do well, every little objective that they achieve, it kind of adds to that self-esteem bank and makes them a much more confident athlete. Those are the things that I love. They're my favorite coaching moments. So um, when it comes to, to, to coaching, and, and some of these may, may have already come out through, through what some of the things you've spoken about already. But what are some of your really core coaching beliefs, you know, philosophies that you really anchor your coaching into? 
Um, for me, um, movement efficiency is, is key. Um, so getting young athletes, analyzing them. So I will look at, when we talk about speed and, and training for speed, for me, my philosophy is that I need to build the physical capacities in the athletes to allow them to be fast. So it's not just about, there's a real big difference between speed training and speed coaching in my mindset. Um, and speed coaching means that you're going to be analyzing your athletes and working out, okay, well, what are the physical competencies that they're missing, which allows them to be fast? Um, you know, is it that they've got pelvic girdle restrictions? Is it they've got ankle complex restrictions? Whatever it might be. Is it an elasticity issue? What, whatever it is. But I'm looking for physical competencies first, and then I'm developing the speed because you can't be fast unless the body is ready to be fast. So that's probably where I sit in terms of that. Um, but in terms of philosophies and beliefs, um, I'm a big believer in the fact that if you're doing your job right as a coach, you're very much an influencer of young minds. And so for me, it's a real responsibility in the fact that you're having that moment each week to develop really good human beings, not just athletes. Um, so for me, that's really paramount as well. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, and I really love to, um, you know, just build that in the athletes, build that knowledge in them that, um, that everyone has something, do you know what I mean, that they're good at and everyone is talented at something. So let's find where their niche is. Let's see where, that, where they sit. And that could be in terms of what event that you choose, or it could be, you know, in terms of what kind of human being you end up being. Um, so, you know, I don't accept bad behavior of any kind with my athletes. Um, and sometimes you can train that out of them. Um, do you know what I mean? Like you need to train sort of behaviors that you accept and that you don't accept in the training environment. Um, and I think the other thing too, is that because I work with a lot of footballers and netballs, field and court-based sports, letting athletes know that they don't have to be there. Do you know what I mean? When you're working with young athletes, sometimes the athletes are there to fulfill a parent dream, not their own dream. And so I think you have to be really mindful of that as a coach of young athletes. Do you know what I mean? That, um, yeah, I think it's really important to know that it's about them um, and it's about them finding what they are talented at. And hopefully I can then help them to, um, you know, enhance that and bring that to the forefront and allow them to be the best that they can be. Because every child is talented. Do you know what I mean? So we just need to find their little niche. And especially in athletics, there's so many different events that you can enter. It's about finding what they're good at and then making them great at that and knowing that they can be great. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, prior to this session, Renelle, people had the chance to put some questions forward that they would like answered tonight. And people could, are also welcome to and are putting questions in the chat box. So we, mm -hmm. we might go to, to some of those now. Now, I, I've actually... The ones that came in prior, I've actually grouped, and there are some that are around running technique. There's some around coaching cues, um, but you did talk a little bit about building the physical capacities in mm. in, in athletes, and and people are very interested in, in what type of, if you want to call it, strength training. I suppose that that young athletes should be doing. Would you like yeah. to give us some of your ideas about that? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the age that you've got. So I might go through some of those age age groups. So we said that we had some, um, some coaches that were working with like the five to eight year old bracket. And I mean, even at that age group, your young athletes can do things where they're doing, where you're teaching good mechanics in them. So, you know, they're doing body weight squats, they're doing lunges, they're doing push ups. You know, you can take them to monkey bars and get them doing pull ups, but they're doing basic strength based activities. And also the most important thing in that, in that age bracket as well is building tendon strength and elasticity. So you want them jumping. So, you know, things like um, uh, double leg jumps, single leg jumps, teaching them to land properly, all those sorts of things are really important um, in that age bracket. I mean, jumping's important for everyone. It's a big, big thing for me. If you want to be fast, if you're working with those older athletes, it's all about lift, jump, sprint. You know, you have to be strong. You have to jump to get elastic power and you have to sprint. Sprinting is the number one plyometric activity and the number one thing that you need to get fast. Um, but I think in terms of strength training, you need to start with that body weight function. You need to start jumping. And then the other thing that I would start to do in the eight to 12 year bracket is I would start to teach lifting techniques, but with um, like a, um, 
um, like a broomstick handle or a dowel or something like that, where I'd start to teach lifting techniques in young athletes. So they're just going through ranges of motion. So that by the time you do load them, you've got confident, you know, confident lifters that are going to be moving load through correct kinetic chains and ranges of motion. I think, I think that's really important. Um, but vertical and horizontal jumps are really, really critical in young athletes. Horizontal propulsion, obviously, for acceleration. Vertical propulsion for when we're in transition and top speed and we need that vertical propulsion of the pelvis is really important. And developing that stiffness and that elasticity through the ankle complex as well. So when I talk about stiffness, I'm talking about the athlete being able to um, run explosively, so get into sprint speed without collapsing, without gravity pulling down on them. So that real postural integrity and being able to almost bound like a spring off the track or off the field. Um, and the elasticity is all about, you know, that tendon strength, making sure that the tendons are working for you like a rubber band. So one of the analogies that I use with my young athletes is like a slingshot. So it's almost like their muscles have to be the rubber band and their skeleton is the slingshot. So if they pull that muscle back over the skeleton, it needs to be able to explode and drive them forward or upward, depending on whether it's horizontal or vertical propulsion. Um, and so if that's stiff or rigid, we we're talking about those physical competencies for speed. So if that's rigid, if the muscle doesn't have the characteristic of elasticity um, or even extensibility to be able to extend, then the athlete has to like muscle out or trying to grunt out their speed. There's no real... Um, I was going to say there's real, no real natural propulsion going on. Um, and just using the word natural, it makes me, um, makes me laugh because I had a baseballer that I was working with last season. He's just signed a million dollar contract with the um, Pirates. And he um, was not a natural runner in any sense. He was, most of the track coaches here, you'd watch him run and you'd think, oh no, what do I do here? And so we built him into this beautiful athlete. And um, when he went across, all of the um, scouts over there were classing him as this natural runner. And I was thinking he was not a natural runner at all. But these are the things that we can bring out in our athletes, right? Um, by looking at those physical competencies and developing the whole. Um, but I, I digress. Let me get back to strength training. Um, so in terms of the strength training, once you've gone through where you... So we're starting with body weight. We're moving into jumping vertical and horizontal jumps. With your youth, remember, you've got to teach them to land before they jump. So there's a whole lot of drills where we do where you might be just reaching up towards the sky. You get them to do a little propulsion and then land, almost in the starting position of a counter movement squat. So you're teaching your athletes to land really well with their knees over their feet. And then from there, you can move into single leg landings. And then you can really start doing like your concentric jumps, like your box jumps and all those sorts of things. And believe it or not, the effort of just doing good functional movement through body weight training, doing jumps where I'm learning how to control myself eccentrically as well. So I'm not collapsing down to the ground in my jumps, but I'm controlling the, the body in space as it's making contact with the ground again. Plus then the sprint training that they're doing, that will make them really fast athletes. So then you can start to load them. When we get up into like the, you know, 13 to 16 to 18 bracket, that's when we're loading our athletes. That's when we're starting to, you know, um, well, even in the younger ages, you know what I mean? Like that 10 to 13 age bracket, you know, you're using medicine balls. So you're actually getting that propulsion going where you can push through those concentric efforts and those power efforts with the body without having to decelerate. You know, when you're in the gym and you might be doing a bench press, for example, and you're accelerating the bar, but you then have to decelerate to control the end point of the lift. The same with a squat and all those sorts of things. So all of our traditional lifts have an accelerotory, but then a decelerotory controlled mechanism so that you don't destroy the joint structures. Well, when you use medicine balls, you don't have to worry about that because you're releasing the load. So medicine balls are something that I use with all of my athletes and they are fabulous because you've got the power and the concentric explosiveness, but you don't have to have the decel control because you're releasing the load. Um, so I use a lot of med ball work with my youth athletes. I also use a lot of strength band and bungee work with my youth athletes as well. So where, for example, if you're just teaching nice accelerotory mechanics, you might put a, a strength band around the hips. And it's really, really good if you've got young athletes that are flexed at the hip and you want them to have good lean, but without that excessive flexion of the pelvis, so the glutes in this stretch position, and you know the glutes are the powerhouse for acceleration, then by putting a strength band around their hips and holding them from behind, 
it forces the body without them even thinking about it to push the pelvis forward. So now you're getting that nice concentric effort of the glutes driving them forward and getting them into nice accelerator mechanics. Um, so I use strength bands a lot, some bungees, and then I'll pull the athletes um, who in the field have been learning techniques with, as I said, a broomstick or a dowel. Now we're in the gym and we're loading and we're going through all of the, um, you know, the, the ex, you know, classic um, strength-based work. But then even in the gym, you know, you have to look at, um, have I got a concentric, powerful athlete where I'm really working on max strength? Remember when you're working on max strength, it's really only the first 10 metres of the sprint effort, do you know what I mean? That, that the strength work is going to dictate how will you get out of the blocks and how will you get into acceleration? The rest of it, once you get into top speed, that's where your elasticity comes into play, your postural integrity comes into play, um, all those sorts of things. So the plyometric kind of stuff becomes more important through transition and into top speed. Um, I, I've been talking a lot about strength training, but that's what I do. No, that, that's that's, yeah. that's fantastic. No, it's part, absolutely, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Where, where, where do you fit it in, Ronelle? Do, do you pop it in the warm-up? Well, I mean, where, do you, where does some of this stuff go that, that, that you've been talking about? So in terms of the strength training, what will happen is that obviously the strength bands, the medicine ball work and the bungee kind of resisted kind of work will all go within the session itself. Um, but my athletes are very accustomed to doing homework. Um, and what I do is depending on the, yeah, depending on, on the athlete's schedule, some of the field and court based athletes have ridiculous schedules, which um, it'll be nice to talk to in Elise's question about loading for young athletes and how much volume of training that they should be doing. Um, but we do microdosing. So for example, you might get an athlete to do, just say we want them to get a stronger glute function. These are our youth athletes. You might get them to do a series of smallly loaded glute bridges or um, you know, glute walking bridges or glute walkouts for hamstring uh, robustness um, and strength through the back chain. And you might do that as like a five minute workout that they do at night before they go to bed. Or you might say to them, do you know what I mean, when, when do you want to put the five minutes? And they might say, okay, well, you know, I might do it when I get home before I start my homework or something. There's five minutes and it has to be at the same time every second day. Or usually I'll have glute bridges one day, core development the next day. Because what we're finding in our youth is that they're all, their posture is terrible. All the coaches on here can, um, you know, will know that their posture is terrible because everything that we do now is down. They're on the keyboard, they're playing with PlayStations. You know, when we went to school, everything was teacher focused. So we were always up, we were always looking forward at the board. Whereas now it's student focused. And so there's more activities where everyone's down and they're looking at what they're doing. So that breeds poor posture. And then they're doing the same when they come home as well. Um, and sitting all day, that causes us problems as well in the pelvic function, which we can talk about later. But postural integrity. So I'll do a lot of core. So I might do glute work on one night, core work on the next night. And the core work is designed to give them the postural integrity that we need through transition and top speed. Um, and also strengthen that. Because if you think about the young athletes, the arm drive, we talk about a summation of forces running through the body. So that arm drive, that force and that strength that's been created has to get to the feet but it has to travel through the torso to get there. And so what you'll find is some athletes will almost look like a washing machine running down the track. And that's because they don't have any postural integrity. They've got too much axial rotation going through the spine. So they'll get different core work, which will be anti-rotational work for their core training. You'll get athletes that are just hunched, that will have a lot of back positioning. So when I talk about core training, I'm talking about shoulder girdle, pelvic girdle, and everything in between, back, sides, and front, everything. And I'll look at the athlete and I'll say, what needs to strengthen to give them the posture that I need to get them down the track or to add that summer forces that's coming from the arm drive into the feet to propel them again um, horizontally down the track. So glutes, every day has to be the same. Kids need a schedule and it needs to be something that's on the same day every day of the week um, to keep them in that little routine. And if they know this is my five minutes of, of do you know what I mean? you know, homework, then, you know, I'm going to do it at the same time. And you can tell as a coach when the kids aren't doing it. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm at the point where I can just say, okay, you're not coaching with me anymore. <laughs> you don't do your homework. <laughs> Most people are not that fortunate. So, Renell, you, you, you touched on some running technique there. People were interested in, in running technique. And if you had, you know, again, any, any advice regarding what you see as important in a running or a, a sprint technique and maybe even yeah. some associated coaching cues that you like using to, to get 
young athletes to achieve the technique that you're looking for? Yeah. The coaching cues are really interesting. There's so much research coming out now on uh, coaching cues and the difference between um, internal and external cueing, and then even analogies, using analogies for young athletes. Um, and with the cueing, um, the cueing for me will be based on the age of the athlete again. So like if I've got a young athlete and I'm working on foot strike, so we'll talk about the importance of the ankle in terms of sprint performance. Um, and Penny talked about dorsiflexion last week in the, in the session. Um, and the fact that if the athlete's foot is in a toe down position, and with a lot of the athletes that I work with, their coaches are constantly saying to them, get on your toes, get on your toes. I mean, track coaches don't do that. We're a little bit wiser than that. Um, but the thing is that as soon as you're on your toes, you're in a plantar flex position and you're in a braking position. So um, your foot comes out in front and it actually grabs the ground out in front of the pelvis, which means that your force is going, is driving you backwards. So you're overcoming a braking force on every step. As soon as you pull the toe back into a dorsiflex position, which is where the toes pull back towards the shin, now the foot has the space to come underneath and hit under the pelvis and drive horizontal propulsion. So that's what we're looking for. But if the athlete's calf complex is so tight that they actually don't have the extensibility through the musculature to be able to pull the foot back, it doesn't matter how much cueing you give that athlete, they're not gonna be able to get there because their body doesn't go there. So then what you need to do is you need to say, okay, well, in one of those micro dosing sessions, we need to do some calf care complex work. where We're going to lengthen the, the musculature of the calf complex. We might want to stiffen dorsiflex some position by doing some stiffness jumps and things like that. And we want to get the ankle complex into a position where it can now apply force to the ground and add that propulsive um, mechanism to the athlete. The other thing that I see a lot in terms of mechanics is the pelvic complex is really tight. And we talked before about athletes sitting down all the time at school and then sitting on the bus or the train and then sitting down at home. And the only time that our young athletes seem to be training now is when they're in regimented, um, you know, sports programs because they're not out playing the way that we used to play. So the hip flexors have become really tight, which has given them a stretched glute and we need the exact opposite for speed. We need the hip flexor to elongate. We need the glutes to be really strong and powerful because that's what drives our propulsion, both vertical and horizontal. And the glutes are also what controls our deceleration, our landing, our propulsion off one or two feet if we're going for the ball. Um, so the glutes is like one of the primary muscles that we have to look after in our young athletes. Um, and so doing all the glute bridges and all those sorts of things is really, really um, important in developing strength. And as you get into your older athletes, making sure that that hip extensor thrust is really powerful through loaded exercises. Um, so the hips and the calf complex is probably the biggest thing that I see. I'd be interested to hear from the coaches in the chat box things that they see in their athletes that they need corrected so that I can give them some handy hints. Um, the postural axial rotation is a really big, big one as well. Their collapse through the shoulders and just not having good um, postural integrity. Sometimes you might, you can find that if you strengthen the rhomboids, which is the muscle that um, retracts the shoulder blades, you know, you might just take a strength band down to the track with the athletes, put it around a pole and get them doing these kind of actions to strengthen the rhomboids and pull the shoulder blades back. Now, all of a sudden, you've got them upright a little bit more. And that in itself, then, if you can now add those forces to the ground, because speed is about accumulative forces hitting the foot and driving forward propulsion, so now you're already faster because you've strengthened a postural muscle, which allows you to add more force into the feet and into the track. I mean, there's so many things with technique. Um, with the cueing uh, we talked about before, when you've got young, like really young kids, you've got to use a whole lot of fun things. I mean, in track, we've always used the aeroplane analogy. Do you know what I mean? The other ones that you want to do if you're doing an ankling drill for foot strike, um, you know, you might want to say, okay, the carpenters come along and they've dropped all of their nails in the ground and now our feet are the baby hammers and we're going to hammer those nails into the track, do you know what I mean, or into the field so that they've got that idea of hitting and being forceful through foot strike. Um, you know, there's, there's just so many different things. Actually, here's, here's, here's a common one, actually. It's just been popped up in, in the chat box. Dave has just said, um, turned out feet at top Ooh. speed or a turned out foot at top speed. Renelle, what, what would you, any advice about that? Yeah, um, so, if the, um, so if the thigh bone is down and the toe is turned out, 
that's a different thing. But if we've got external rotation of the thigh, so if the thigh is externally rotated and that's causing the foot to go out, then what you'll find is you have really um, tight glute, um, glute medius and TFL. So you, where most athletes have a weak glute medius TFL, if you're working with, with athletes who also play soccer and those sorts of sports, glute med TFL and external rotation is really common because of the way that they actually um, work with the ball. And so what happens then is that you need to stretch the glute med TFL or roll it out and you need to strengthen the adductors to internally rotate the, the thigh. And that will usually correct the foot. So what happens is that the majority of um, dysfunction that we have in the feet usually comes from the pelvis. So that'd be the first thing that I would look at. Um, if the thigh bone is straight, but then you just have the foot kicking out to the side, then I'd be looking at the musculature um, through the lower limb. I'd be looking at the extensibility of that. And I'd be looking at flexion capabilities, so dorsiflexion capabilities. So for me, it would probably be a extensibility issue. We don't have the length through the musculature to hold the foot in the correct position. And that can be fixed through, you know, stretching and using your acuball and all those sorts of things as well. Um, but David, I'm quite happy if you wanted to send a quick little video, um, you know, like tomorrow or the next day of your athlete, I can see exactly what it is and give you an idea of what would um, fix it. Thanks for that, Ronelle. Actually, now just um, let's let's get quickly go go into that question about um, training loads because I, you showed some interest in that before, Ronelle, where it was asked, you know, what what is appropriate training loads? You know, how often, how much, how long, all that. Can you give us any advice on that for yeah. for, for, for young athletes? The kids are really resilient. Um, what we need to look at is an accumulated what what it actually creates an accumulated fatigue, and believe it or not, that. The five to 12 year old kids can usually deal with more than the 12 to 16 year old kids because what happens is that when you go through when you go through puberty, your body takes up so much energy to grow and develop. So we always talk about um, any young athlete having a fuel tank and that fuel tank doesn't change. But what comes out is that you actually have school, which diminishes it. You then have you know, you might have family issues or challenges at home, which will emotionally, you know, drop the, the fuel tank down. You might have played football or like us, full rush, do you know what I mean, during lunchtime, and then it goes down again. So you have to work out when the athlete presents themselves to training, where their fuel tank is for that day. And whether or not the athlete's getting the correct nutrition and sleep, because sleep is the huge thing for us right now, working with young athletes, as to whether or not a fuel tank the next day has gone back to being full or whether it's still half loaded. The big thing that I would be looking at, first of all, rather than talking about volume of load, because for me, I have found over the last probably six to seven years that I can't generalize over what age group actually can deal with, you know, 10 hours or six hours or two days of training or four days of training. I'm looking at each athlete individually and that's because if they're on their phone all night, there's not strict rules in the household about getting, you know, eight to 10 hours of sleep. And believe it or not, young athletes need, you know, that are in that teenage bracket, they need more than eight hours sleep. We've got research that shows that if you have less than eight and a half hours sleep, you're seven times more likely to get injured. Um, and that's between the 13 to 18 age bracket. So we're looking for these athletes to have nine and 10 hours of sleep and for them to understand that, when they're sleeping, that's when the body is restoring. That's when they're getting their physiological adaptations to their training. Um, and so we need this sleep to become almost like another component of their training so that they understand that. So that's the first thing that I'll look at because if they're not getting their correct sleep, I can't give them the volume of training that I normally would. Then the next thing that I'm looking at is nutrition. So if they've got really good nutritional intake, nutrition is healing for the body, nutrition is energy for the body, nutrition is growth and structure and all those sorts of things. So again, if the athlete's in a family environment where they're not getting good nutrition, then the volume of training has to be pulled back again because they're at higher risk of injury. If they're in an environment where they live in a perfect family, the parents that I love, where they've got great nutritional intake, they're sleeping between their eight and up to 10 hours a night, um, then you've got an athlete that you can load correctly. So then all you have to do as an athlete is ask them when they first rock up to training, where are you at today? And I do that with all of my athletes. We talk about 
you know, I, I say to them, one to 10, one, I'm dead, I want to go to bed, or 10, I'm full of energy and I'm ready to go. And if that's the case, if they're sitting like six to seven, you have to modify your session plan for that day. So it's not just having that mindset that this is the plan, this is what we're doing. Now, I have the luxury, of course, of working uh, with older teams or in, with my younger athletes, I work one-on-one -on -one for that specialty training. So I have the luxury of modifying. If you're working with a group of 20 kids, you can't do that just because one kid's tired. <laughs> but you might look at them and have a look at their te technique as they're coming down the track and say, okay, you're going to sit this next rep out. And it's not because I'm punishing you. It's because I'm rewarding you. I, I don't know what you say to those young kids, but do you know what I mean? You have to try and protect them because it's your job to protect them in that training environment. But if you want to go textbook averages, so not taking in any of that kind of stuff, when you're working with the um, five to eight year olds, they should be doing maybe two nights a week, one hour training, and then maybe um, doing a little bit of training and then add on the five minute micro doses. So you can do like two five minute micro doses, which is 10 minutes a day, which is um, you know another 70 minutes of training that week, but it's just really broken down. Um, you know, when you've got your eight to 12 year olds, you know, they can do two to three sessions a week and then compete on the weekend. Again, add in those micro doses, which are very specific and customized to that specific athlete. By the time they get to like 13, 14, you know, I mean, my athletes, you know, are training three, once they get to 16, four sessions a week and then competing on the weekend. Um, you know, the, my um, open athletes are doing AM, PM sessions. So they'll be in the gym in the morning. They're on the track in the evening. They're doing that three to four days a week. And then they're, they've got additional training, um, you know, on the Saturday. So, but again, I wouldn't do that load if they didn't have correct sleep and nutrition and things like that. Yeah, that's some fantastic advice. Thanks for that, Renal. Yeah. Um, when, when it comes to learning about coaching, Renal, how do, how do you learn? Do you, do you still continue to learn? And where, do you have any recommended resources or, or places for people to go to, to learn? Yeah, I sure do. So I've got a few favourites. I mean, I uh, anyone that's in strength and conditioning knows that to be a part of ASCA, you have to have a mentor. So there's this whole mentorship program. Um, so I have a few mentors. I have Ashley Jones, who's um, in the US. He's one of the big strength and conditioning coaches that I grew up with. Um, and um, the head of high performance at the Brumbies um, with the Rugby Union. Um, John, I work with him. But books, let me tell you about some books which you're going to get a lot of information. If you love the science like I do, so I'm like a big science geek in terms of physiology, biomechanics, physics, all those sorts of things, then this is the book for you. I pulled them out of my bookshelf for everyone. So this is called Running. This is Biomechanics and Physiology. This is a 2005 book by um, Bosch and Klomp. It's very science heavy. So if you love the science, this is a really big, thick book that for me, this is my second version of the book. The other one's all riddled and fallen apart. If you want speed, strength for training, David, I saw yours in terms of strength for speed development. I want to talk about that again before we go. So don't let me go away without doing that for you. Um, this Strength Training for Speed by James Wilde. This is a really good one. This is one of my friends from the UK um, who works in track and in football in the UK. This is a really easy to understand book. And if you're one of those uh, uh, coaches that just wants the program written for you, so that's so that all the work is done, then James has done that for you. So that's called Strength Training for Speed, Principles and Practical Application. And the really cool thing is that there's some really nice stuff here about technique as well. And this is for sprinters um, at the beginning. So if you want a book that's really easy to understand, it's got programs in there ready to go, then Strength Training for Speed by James Wilde is your book. There's a new book that's just come out, um, which I'm loving. I've only gotten through um, the first, I started on page 72 though. It's called Speed Strength. Um, and this one is by Joel um, Smith, and he's actually the guy that does the podcast for Just Fly Performance. Yes, David, you know him. So that's a great podcast, right? Um, and this book, again, it's a little bit on the science-y. It's not as heavy science as The Running by Wash and Klopp, um, but it's still a bit science-y, but you can read through the science in this one and get to the really good stuff. They're my three favourite books um, in terms of developing um, real explosive speed in athletes. Um, and then the Just Fly um, Sports Performance is really good. The Rob Pacey, um, the Pacey Performance Podcast is really good as well. 
Um, he's just gotten onto his 300th episode. And I remember I did episode 46 with, um, with Rob back in the day, I think maybe three, four years ago now. That's a really good one as well. So if you're a person that loves to listen to podcasts as you're running or traveling to work or whatever it might be, they're probably the two that I would go to for speed development and just hunt through the actual ones where you can see the speed. And they're my three books um, that I would go to. David, I want to quickly talk about strength and speed development for you because I saw that on your chat and I don't want to let you leave before I go in terms of that. In terms of accelerated speed, you're looking at glute cord function. So you're looking for postural integrity. So you're looking at things like horizontal propulsion, prowlers and sleds um, on the track. You can take the sleds and the prowlers to the track and get even young athletes pulling and pushing. Okay, that's something you can do at any age. The difference is, is that as you get older, you load those sleds, yeah? In the gym, um, it's really about the technical competency of the athlete in the gym as to where you'd go. But again, you're looking for strong hip extensor thrust um, and knee extensor thrust as well with good postural integrity. Um, but the other thing is that you can't just lift weight. That's why I have this whole philosophy, lift, jump, sprint, because you have to lift and you have to jump. So never get an athlete just squatting without squatting and jumping. So as soon as they rack the bar, pull them out, and they're doing either pogo jumps or rocket jumps or explosive squat jumps. If they're coming off out of an RDL, you want them doing the kettlebell swing. So you want to think about how the nervous system acts with the musculature. So think about loading force through the musculature and then getting the nervous system to act quickly through the plyometric activity. Um, that's the big thing for strength. And in terms of um, then transitioning to top speed, that is all jumping. So all of your plyometric work, your jumps, all those sorts of things are going to give you that elastic function that you need in top speed. Um, because the stuff that you do with the weight training, that's really only acceleration. Once you get up out of acceleration, it's all glute hamstring. Um, and it's hamstring in an eccentric load contact phase. And so that's all elasticity. And stiffness of the foot. You can't be a good sprinter without stiff ankles, um, which means that there's not going to be any drop in force and you're not going to collapse. Sorry, Darren. No, that's look, fantastic answers. And, and in fact, another one's popped up in, in the chat box. Do you have any um, advice about uh, the use of arms in sprinting? Where, where some people, you, you can see uh, low arms, um, all, whatever. What would you say about sprinting yeah, arms? Yeah, I know what they're talking about. Megan, yes, I know exactly. So we've got this real culture now. I'm going to try and show you on my screen where the athletes are running like this. So I call them drummer boy. Um, because they're not actually using the shoulder to punch the elbow back. The action's coming from the elbow. Um, and my husband likes to call this the um, PlayStation generation. Um, I'm not sure if that's what's caused the issue, but they don't have this nice range of motion through the shoulder girdle. And the other thing that could be happening there too is that you've got your anterior deltoid and your pectoral group here pulling the shoulders down. So the capacity to actually get that back into the position where you get a really nice arm drive is difficult. So two things to look at. If you've got the arms swaying all over the place, you can do a simple drill where you get the athletes to sit down. I think it's on my website, actually. Um, get the athletes to sit down, elbows. And what I do is I give the athletes a stick in both hands. So you can use relay buttons, if what I normally use. But if you don't have relay buttons, just find two sticks that are lying on the ground under a tree, put them in their hands because the body has preservation built in. They're not gonna jab themselves in the eye with a stick. So if you put two long sticks in their arm, you get them to drive, the arm is gonna come into this position because they want the stick avert, like, you know, moving away from the face. And so it's a correction that you can do with young athletes and they don't even realize that they're doing it. They were running like this. And now all of a sudden they're running like this just because they've got two things that could jab them in the eye if they don't. Um, and if you train that repetitively over time, then that becomes the new normal. So you might just want to do that as a part of a warm up, um, just to train that function. The other thing that I've done with athletes, um, when you're saying they're pushing through water or they're doing some sort of thing like this, that's what they're doing. So they're like this. So we call these fairy arms. <laughs> so we've got these arms moving around. And again, what you want to do is you want to probably put something into their hands. Um, and get them sitting down on the ground and just focusing on punching the elbow back. So sometimes even with athletes, what I've done is I've stood behind and I've just put my hands up like focus pads in boxing. And I've said to them, just punch your elbow back into my arm. So I want them to drive back as though they're hitting me as hard as they can, just so that you're getting a new normal. And all you need to do is just 
do this sporadically, you'd be surprised at how quickly the nervous system will pick up a new movement pattern and then we'll lock into it. So just a little bit of perseverance, I think. Hey, um, Renelle, just um, a couple more questions. Um, do you have a number one tip for coaches who, who might just be starting out? I think my number one tip is just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean it's right. So I think what happens is that if you're a new coach starting out, your first thought process is, is to coach the way that you were coached. Whereas if you were coached even a decade ago, I mean, I don't coach the way I coached five years ago. Um, so I think that my biggest piece of advice is read as much as you can, listen to the podcast, find what's going on in sprint speed development and coaching now not don't coach the way that you were coached and don't assume that the way that you, you were coached was correct um, because sports science has really moved in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years um, and so we need to constantly be reading and it's constantly changing as we get more and more research coming through so i think that's probably my number one piece of advice don't coach the way that you were coached don't assume that that was correct um, also maybe find a mentor find someone that you know is further along in the journey or the path that you're taking and jump on board and get some good advice from them. Um, and I think that most people worth their soul in coaching, um, you know, will help young coaches out as much as possible. They won't see it as a drain on their time, but they, their thought process is about the athletes. And so they want all athletes to improve under all coaches. So they'll be really, um, yeah, really willing to help out. But read, research, yeah, do your homework if you've got time. Yeah. I want to quickly answer this question. Laura, you said is the same action for endurance running. Endurance running is a little bit more relaxed. So in sprint speed, it's a really strong drive. In endurance running, it's much more relaxed and the movement pattern is smaller. Except for then if you have got athletes coming at you and you need to make a sprint for the finish, then you open up those arms. <laughs> so... Renell, when it comes to coaching, what's, what's, what's coming up next to you? What, for you, what do you see on, on the horizon with, with your coaching? As a full-time coach for me, it's always really big. There's always a ton of work on which I'm loving. I've just finished up all of the uh, speed programming and mobility and tissue integrity programming for New South Wales Baseball for their high performance program. So that's all the under 16 and the under 18. So that starts next week, which I'm excited about. I've just, um, I recently launched a, a website called Running with Renell. And that's where I can give access to, I mean, I've got athletes in Melbourne, in Canberra. I've got a few country regional um, athletes as well, but they basically can get all of their coaching online. Um, I've got a Speedy Rennell Athletic Programming app, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm about to launch my Learning with Rennell website um, because I have 20 year history in education as well. I'm going to be doing a website where I'll have webinars, I'll have short courses, I'll have long courses, all on speed and athletic development. So I'm really excited about that as well. And then the strength and conditioning work with the Fury. It's constant. I love it. Well, Renelle, it has been absolutely fantastic having you with us. Um, thank you so, so much for, for your time. You've given us lots and lots to think about and lots and lots of great advice and examples and, and, and also the thought behind those examples, which I, I think has been really helpful to everyone. So we really appreciate your generosity and, and the time you spent with us. And so thank, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thank Renelle. you so much for having me and thanks for attending everyone. Thanks for now. Thank you. Bye.